Thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar, Bringing Inspiration to Multiple Generations, Apollo in Real Time. My name is Paige Graff. I'm coming to you from the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, along with my colleagues, Suzanne Foxworth and Julie Fouché. We're so glad to be joining with all of you today. And I really wanna take a moment to welcome all our participants who are really from all parts of our nation. 18 different states are participating. We've got group, a group in Mexico that is also joining us today. And our student range in sort of grades goes from second grade all the way up to 12th grade and then even some adults. So we welcome all of you from all around the nation. If you're a blue dot on that map, that means you are joining us live. I also wanna take a moment to welcome our featured speaker, Ben Feist. We're, I'm so excited to have Ben Feist with us here today. He is a data visualization engineer who does some work for us here at the NASA Johnson Space Center with our Astro Materials Division. And we are lucky to have him with us to tell us about how you can bring inspiration to multiple generations with Apollo in real time. So with that, welcome again, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm gonna turn things over to Ben, who'll share his screen, as well as tell us a little bit about himself, as well as Apollo in real time. So Ben, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's very exciting for me to talk to so many people at the same time about some of the work that I do. I don't very often get to show this to everybody, and, and some of the people uh, who are tuning in today will be the first people to see a lot of this work. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit about myself uh, in that I'm a software engineer and what a software engineer is, is somebody who builds things. Basically, you make, I make things on the internet and I've done this for a very long time and I didn't always work for NASA. I'm a new NASA employee. I've only worked at NASA for about one year now. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what my background was and how I got that job. And hopefully some of you will recognize that this can happen for you as well if you, if you work hard in school. Um, I uh, work as, as uh, was mentioned by Paige in the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division at Johnson Space Center in Houston. And that's a very long title, but that basically means the place where we study the moon rocks that were brought back by the astronauts on the Apollo missions. And I'm gonna tell you about the Apollo missions today. The exploration science part of that is the fact that scientists need to learn how to do science when they're on another planet. And the, how are we going to gather that scientific data when we're somewhere that's very different from home? And that's a very exciting thing for me to be able to help with. I was uh, a Lego kid. This is me and my little sister. Uh, and this is a, I don't know if this toy is even made. This is a toy called Capsilla. And I thought I'd put this uh, funny picture of me from when I was a kid up here so that you can all see that, uh, you know, you start young. If you're somebody that builds things, they, it can be evident when you're really young. So if some of you kids uh, like using Lego or doing other engineering type activities or like writing programs or making games, this is exactly the kind of background that I had before I led, it led me all the way to working at NASA. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about Apollo. Now, Apollo were the missions that happened between 1969 and 1972, when we landed on the moon six times. A lot of people think we only landed on the moon on Apollo 11, because that's the famous one, because Apollo 11 was the first time we landed on the moon. And, uh, but today we're gonna talk about uh, the first one and the last one, Apollo 11 and Apollo 17. Because 11 was the very first time that we stepped out onto the surface and 17, for the last three missions, 15, 16, and 17, uh, the crew lived on the surface for three days and had a car they could drive around in, and it was quite the extensive missions. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you about both of those today. But before we get into it, I wanna ask the first question that I hope people can respond with. And that's how many people do you think worked on the Apollo missions? And this includes everybody on the ground, the astronauts that were in space, and the people that built all the hardware that got us there. And what kind of jobs do you think those people had? So I'll wait for some of the answers in the chat window. All right, so here's a chance for you to think about 
again, these Apollo missions, six missions to the moon, how many people do you think were a part of that working on those missions and what kind of jobs did they have? So we have a lot of C's coming in from Cannon Elementary, New Mexico Museum. Uh, Creekview High School says also C, as does Randall Middle School. Some groups, one of the other groups from Meadow Creek thinks maybe B, about 4,000 folks. In yeah. terms of the types of jobs these people might have had, we're getting mission control. Yeah. Um, that's that's one, one thing. We'll see if others are, I think they're really thinking about the, the numbers right now. Most are saying C. Now, Cannon Elementary saying engineers, software yeah. engineers, astronomers, mathematicians from Downs Elementary, suppliers, engineers, scientists, doctors, mathematicians. That came from Freedom Middle School. Central Heights Elementary is mentioning engineers. Murfreesboro Middle School says builders pilots, computer engineers, astronauts. Evansville added in uh, construction doctors, writers, photographers. Um, Cannon Elementary has added in mechanical engineers, materials engineers. Randall Middle is saying ground control as well as astronomers, um, computer scientists, commanders, engineers, scientists, and even geologists was added in by our Aerospace Academy in Mexico. Now, one more I'll mention or so, Corpus Christi Catholic School says electronic engineers, and Meadow Creek and, uh, adds in designers, spacesuit engineers, and so many more. So, Ben, yeah. I'm here in mostly C for your <laughs> number of folks, and then a variety of jobs. What do you think? I think I haven't seen any wrong answers yet. There's a lot of different people uh, that had a lot of different jobs uh, working on these projects. And the answer is 400,000 people across the United States uh, worked on and built the spacecraft and worked on the missions. And they needed everything from writers and poets to filmmakers, doctors, all kinds of things, secretaries, that, things that you wouldn't normally uh, think of because people tend to think of the astronauts or and obviously there were a lot of answers that talked about the different types of engineering and those were all important of course but there's a lot a broad uh, group of different people there were even people that sewed the spacesuits together that worked as seamstresses uh, and they those people actually worked at a clothing company and they got the contract to build the spacesuits so you can imagine so one day you're you're building you're, you're making clothes for a living, and the next day you're making a spacesuit for Apollo astronauts. Pretty incredible. Awesome. So it's great to know these folks are thinking, and even Ben, they um, a couple of groups put in firefighters, who could have been a helpful part in some way, shape, or form, especially making sure things were safe. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm trying to get a video to play here. There we go. So here, this is some old footage uh, that we had rescanned in the last year uh, that shows some of the people that worked on Apollo and just the vast number of them. And you can see these are big high bay engineering areas where they were building spacecraft. And uh, when Neil Armstrong was coming back on Apollo 11, he dedicated uh, and a, a great big thank you to the people that worked so hard and put their heart and all their efforts into building the spacecraft that they were in. And they said they had three spacecraft. They had the command module, the lunar module. The command module was the one that got them there. The lunar module landed on the surface. And the third spacecraft, he said, was the spacesuit that we walked on the surface in, which was really a type of spacecraft, if you think about it. So I want to talk first about Apollo 17. I'm going to do the last one first, just for fun. It was the last mission to the moon. And it launched in 1972 in December. It actually, the anniversary is about to start in two days. And so two days, 48 years ago, uh, they uh, launched Apollo 17. And here's, a, here's some footage of the launch that I wanted to show you that we just rescanned. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence.
pretty great. I love it because you can't see the rocket launch because it's so bright. It was the only night launch of the Saturn V rocket, which took all the crew, all the different missions to the moon was the same type of rocket called the Saturn V. And it was 75% the brightness of the sun when it launched. And you can see in the, the exposure of this film that it, it had a bit of a difficulty trying to capture the launch. And you can imagine what it was like to be there in person. When Apollo 17 left, about four hours after they went into Earth's orbit, they lit the engine again and started their journey to the moon. And they turned around and took this picture out the window. Jack Schmidt snapped this picture with his 70 millimeter camera. And it's the only image that's perfectly lit from the back from the sun so that it's not a partial Earth, it's the full Earth. And this is the most requested image in NASA's image library. And it's commonly referred to as the blue marble photo. Anybody wants to look it up. And then the lunar module undocked from the command module when they got into lunar orbit and they did this little pirouette and they, this, they filmed this with a film camera out the window. And there's two people inside this lunar module that are on their way down to the surface. They went around the moon one more time and began their descent and landing. And you can see the shadow of the lunar module here in this film footage as they approached the surface. And uh, they had, by this point, they had done practice this many times and uh, they were pretty good at landing and they landed with plenty of fuel remaining. Uh, the very first landing on Apollo 11, they almost ran out of fuel just before they touched down. It was very frightening. And this is what they lived in. Here's the lunar module after it landed on the surface. And uh, this is after they'd been outside for a little while and you can see the tracks of when they walked around and when they drove their, their lunar rover around. This is what their lunar rover looks like. And that's Jack Schmidt. Jack Schmidt was a geologist. He's the only scientist that went to the moon. And he, he explored there for three days and collected samples and took photographs and took lots of notes. Here's another famous picture of Jack uh, standing next to a boulder. Now they're very far away from the, the lunar module at this point. And it's actually, the lunar module is hidden in this picture, but it looks unfair because you guys are on a webcast. You're not gonna be able to see the, the lunar module off in the distance, but I'll, I'll help you and put an arrow. It's right there. And if you zoom into this picture, you can see it there just sitting out on the surface. And you can kind of see a faint white patch where it's sitting and that's where the descent engine scrubbed the surface of the moon a little bit with its thrust when it's coming in. They also took pictures from that uh, point of view with a 50 millimeter, oh, sorry, a 500 millimeter lens. And they got this picture. And you can see the lunar module just sitting out there looking pretty fragile, just sitting on the surface of the moon. That's their only way home. And that's where they had to live for three days. And they got pretty dirty, covered in moon dust. They would have to come back in with their dirty spacesuits. And then when the, when the spacecraft repressurized with air, the dust would become airborne. And they started to look like coal miners after three days. And that's Commander Gene Cernan. Uh, I think he, he was probably screaming something about needing a shower. I'm not sure, but uh, it could be something like that. Uh, and I have one question here. Sorry, that was a blank slide. I have a question, that, another question I'd like to ask everybody is how do you think the astronauts got back into lunar orbit after they were on the surface for three days? Do you think they launched from a separate rocket that was on the moon for them to come back in? Do you think the command module descended to the surface to pick them up? Do you think the lunar module launched itself off the surface to rendezvous with the command module? Or do you think all of these are just made up trick questions? And I'll let the, some of the chats uh, be the answers. All right, so thinking about they're on the surface of the moon, how did they get back home? And so uh, Downs Elementary immediately said they launched from the surface of the moon or C. We have agreement in that from the Aerospace Academy. Meadow Creek and, uh, is also in agreement with that. Central Heights and Randall Middle don't think any of those seem like viable <laughs> solutions. I think I'm tricky. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like, a, you know, it kind of sounds somewhat science fiction-y. Now, Creekville High School says, C, the bottom part was left on the surface, but the top part jettisoned them up from the command module. So we'll see perhaps in a little bit if that's partially or somewhat true. 
Murfreesboro Middle School is saying, they also think, I'm not sure about any of those answers. So their students say D. Uh, Benavides says, and that's a Benavides Elementary, they're also in that C range. It doesn't seem like any of those things were true. And Freedom Middle School says, well, they think C about the lunar module. So, you know, this is an interesting question because perhaps, I mean, most of these students weren't even alive. So thinking about how do you get yourself from the surface of the moon to try to get back home, this is an interesting question. So Absolutely. Ben, please do well, share. Yes. Well, uh, I'm, not as, I'm not as tricky as some of the students thought. It's not D, it's C. So I think there was a lot of right answers. And uh, C, by the way, is uh, the most difficult way to do it, but it's the way they did it because it saved the most weight. And when you're saving weight, you don't need as big a rocket to launch from Earth to get to the moon with. The, the configuration that required them to launch from the moon and rendezvous with the command module is called lunar orbit rendezvous. And that was um, what they did on Apollo. And here's a picture of the spacecraft cutting itself in half, leaving the legs and the ladder and the stuff they don't need anymore behind, once again, to save weight. And the ascent stage came up off the surface and you can see the footprints there and the tire prints from their lunar rover printed on the lunar surface. And those prints will stay there for hundreds of thousands of years because there's no wind to blow it away. There's no erosion. So that everything they disturbed, everything they touched, uh, all the footprints they left are gonna remain on the surface. And they had this remote camera on the lunar rover and well, they just left the batteries running and they, that camera uh, filmed them as ascending and then about two hours later, the batteries wore out and it's still sitting there on the surface. I guess if you could go back and put new batteries in, it might even work again, you know, we, we don't know. And this is the ascent stage. So this is the half of the lunar module that came back up again. And you can see how fragile this spacecraft looks. It certainly doesn't look like anything like a jet that flies through the air, because there is no air and no wind resistance. So they didn't have to make it sleek shaped or anything. They could just make it really light and functional. And it was so light, they said they could, they, people said, I don't think anybody ever tried, but people used to say that you could punch through the side of it with a pen if you pushed hard enough. So I guess people, they, the astronauts just had to make sure they didn't do that. <laughs> and they, this is the command and service module that was in lunar orbit uh, with uh, astronaut Ron Evans in orbit, uh, waiting for the crew to come back up. And he was, he was doing experiments in orbit while they were exploring the surface. And you can see the docking mechanism at the very bottom tip there. The lunar module docked with that. They climbed back in and they discarded the lunar module because again, they're saving weight. They don't need it anymore. And the lunar module crashed into the lunar surface and they lit that engine and they came back to Earth and it took them three days to get home. Once they got home, they re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and they were going so fast that the, that the uh, atmosphere pushed so hard on the bottom of the spacecraft that it made it like a fireball when they were coming back in. And they were going Mach 32 when they hit 400,000 feet, uh, which is when the, the atmosphere starts to become apparent. And from Earth, you can actually see, this is from a telescope uh, that, that uh, NASA had to try to track them when they came in. And you can see them coming in in this fireball. Can you imagine there's three people in there that are not too hot because of all the engineering and work that went into designing the command module that they could withstand this heat and pressure coming back into the atmosphere. And I just can't get over that there's people inside that glowing fireball. Then the, at about uh, 10,000 feet, the main parachutes opened. And this slowed the crew down to about 35 kilometers per hour. Then uh, after they floated, descended into the, near the ocean, they Came, came close and splashed down on the surface and helicopters were circling by this point and they got this great photograph of Apollo 17 returning to Earth. And uh, everybody lit cigars and mission control to celebrate a, the last successful Apollo mission. And uh, that if you ever get a chance to go to Johnson Space Center, you can go see this mission control room where all the work was done on all the Apollo missions. The Apollo 17 command module is on display at Johnson Space Center. 
uh, and you, if you go there, this is in the museum, you can, uh, when you're going to go see Mission Control, you can see the actual command module that came in, that glowing fireball, and had the three crew people uh, safely inside. So that's the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I did, because I wanted to make this mission come back to life again. A lot of people didn't know about Apollo 17 because it's the last mission and, and uh, you know, a lot of people know the name Neil, Neil Armstrong from Apollo 11. And the other Apollo missions are just kind of these scientific exploration things and a lot of, not a lot of people got a chance to actually witness what happened. So I wanted to make that happen. And so I got all of the recordings uh, of them discussing things in the space to ground transmissions. I got all the photographs they took. They took 2,400 photographs with that 70 millimeter still camera. I got all the TV transmissions that you can see in the bottom right there. I got all the film that they shot uh, that was 16 millimeter film and that's in the refrigerator in the top right. And uh, there was a transcript that was made in 1973 of all the things that the crew said. And I worked really hard to digitize this transcript and to snap everything in it to mission time so that we knew when everybody said everything on the mission. And essentially what that did is it put everything on a timeline. When photos were taken, you establish what time in the mission they were taken. You establish what time the uh, different uh, transmissions were made. And the transcript and the audio ties the whole thing together because you can kind of hear, hear things rolling forward. And what this does is it actually ties together all that scientific data and all those different media types into uh, a singular unit. And uh, I also added some, some data that we've gathered in 2009. So this is a, a satellite that we launched in 2009, NASA launched. It was built at Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington. And it uh, has been mapping the surface of the moon in great detail since then. It's still working now and it's made some fantastic data. Here's some pictures of the valley that they landed in in, in Apollo 17. And I'm zooming in here into this high resolution image that was taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And if you look closely, you can see something sitting on the surface. And there is the descent stage still sitting there and there are the footprints and tire tracks still left there 48 years later. And like I mentioned, those are gonna last hundreds of thousands of years. So I took this Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data and I made a 3D terrain that had this imagery on top of it. So here's a picture of the surface of the moon in a 3D modeling software that has an image that's the texture of the surface that's from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and it has little models that I've placed in place of, of the actual things that are sitting there. So you can see you know, the shadow that's on the surface, that's the real shadow from the real descent stage. And then I've stuck a model there and you can see the models the right size for the shadow. And I made the lunar module fit the tire tracks so I knew it was gonna be the right size on the surface. And I made these animations that allow you to actually fly over the surface of the moon like you have wings and you're flying there. And you can see exactly where they were. And every splotch and crater and color is exactly a photograph taken of the lunar surface. So really it is just like being there in that, that the moon is a very strange looking place. And if you can create these 3D animations, you basically create a way for them to uh, be recreated for, for everybody to enjoy. So what I use these animations for is to recreate where they drove on the surface. And this is a map, a very rough map from one of the original uh, reports that was done after the mission that where they established where they had driven. And uh, here, here's another map. You can kind of see where they stopped and did things and they figured it all out after the mission. And here's a close up of them driving to station two on the first day, oh sorry, the second day. Um, and uh, when they, they went there, they did some work and then they came back again. And here's that same path on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data that I had created. And if you took a, if you take a uh, camera and you put it in the, in the 3D lunar rover and you look through it, you see a horizon that's exactly like the photographs that were taken at that same point when Jack Schmidt's camera took that same picture. And you can see the shape of the hills in the background, the horizon, is exactly the same in the top image, which is Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data, and the bottom image, which is a real photograph that was taken on Apollo 17. So you could 
you know, I thought maybe I could make the make it make a video of them bouncing along the surface. But this didn't work out very well because you know you got to try things. If you don't know if they're going to work, you got to try them anyway. And this didn't work very well because the the data wasn't high resolution enough, and you can see it's quite blurry in the foreground there, because the the lunar reconnaissance orbiter doesn't take imagery that's that high resolution that you would be able to stand on the surface and look down. But I could make an animation that had a you know a pretend drone or a helicopter flying behind the lunar rover. And this is uh, where they actually drove across the Lee Lincoln scarf from station two on the way to station three. And I made a little dotted line so that you could see where they went. And these images I, I created for the entire Apollo 17 mission. So every time they drove anywhere, you're looking at these animations and you can hear the crew chattering along as they drive. And they're just wonderful places. These, this great adventure that these two people got to go on living there for three days in a valley three times deeper than the Grand Canyon with these stunning images. And, and it also, I didn't really understand, I guess, uh, in my heart, how far away they drove from the lunar module. Like if they, if they got into any trouble, they'd have to walk back. Like if that rover broke, they, that's a long walk. Uh, that's miles and miles away. And here's an animation of them coming up to a a crater called Shorty Crater, which they, is, they also referred to as Station 4. And they decided they wanted to go here because they thought this looked like it could be a volcanic crater, maybe a volcano made it. You can see how there's a bit of dark mantle on the outside of the crater. And they thought, well, maybe this has a volcanic origin from a volcano that was on the moon billions of years ago. And it turns out it wasn't a volcano, but they had to go and check. And that's how we dis discover things in science, you guess. And then you go and you check, and you uh, then can determine whether your guess was right. And here's just some other pictures of this wonderful adventure that these two people were on. And you can see the command module in the far distance in this one. Um, and maybe you can make it out again here. But uh, so these are all online, and, and you, can, you can have a chance to look at them yourself. So here's a, here's a question for you again, because before I show you how I put all this online, I wanna ask you how you guys might do it for something. Like if you had all this stuff, you had pictures, audio files, transcripts, camera rolls of something in your life, like a birthday party or a graduation from different people taking photographs of you at a birthday party and maybe some different people filming things, what would you do in order to allow someone else to experience that in real time? Do you have any ideas on how you would present it? Because you might actually have better ideas than the idea I came up with. And I'm curious. All right, so let's see what you all come up with. So you want somebody to experience something in real time. So it feels like they were there. So Central Heights says, put it into a PowerPoint. Downs Elementary says, augmented reality. Uh, Tannen Elementary says, virtual reality. Creekview yeah. High School also says virtual reality. Now, Corpus Christi Catholic School says you can maybe just make a video. Randall Middle says use some 3D imaging. Meadow Creek says virtual reality and some type of compilation. Now, Evansville Day School says some kind of Lego stop motion video. They That's mentioned cool. I like that one. Yeah, interesting. Now, Aerospace Academy in Mexico, they said virtual reality and 360 photos with some software and mix many photos. Someone else, Canon Elementary says maybe FaceTime. Downs Elementary says a video collage. What about, how are they going to hear audio? So think about, I'm hearing a lot of video stuff. What about that audio stuff? Mm -hmm. Now, Randall Middle as uh, mentions 360 tours. So now think, I want to I want to experience everything about this, um, whether it's a graduation or a party. So people have Evans Day School says songs or graphic no novels. Downs yep. Elementary says audio books. Even Canon says a live podcast. Benavides Elementary says Google Duo or FaceTime. Northern Michigan University says you could act it out or act out a play and video it. Downs Elementary says some type of sort of scratch and sniff cards 
to, you know, get the sense of smells, which is really interesting. And Freedom Middle School says you could do a Zoom webinar. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love these answers. All excellent ideas. Excellent, excellent ideas. ideas. Well, maybe we can get back to some of these ideas. I really like the, uh, the stop motion idea. That's pretty cool. I mean, that is essentially what those animations are I made. They are stop motion. They're just really, really high resolution stop motion. So they look like real motion. So I created a website that everybody can go to, maybe not right now, because I'm in the middle of a presentation for you, um, called Apollo17.org. And Apollo17.org looks like this. And it, basically, this is it. This is the real-time playback of the entire Apollo 17 mission in this one page. And the way it works is there is the whole mission playing in a YouTube video in the top left, and the transcript that I had corrected underneath it. And as the video plays, the transcript scrolls to keep up with what they're saying in the video because everything is timed exactly to the mission time. And you can see the mission time in that digit in the bottom right corner of the uh, YouTube video. And this confusing looking thing at the top is a way for you to use your mouse to hover over three different levels of zoom that allow you to go through the entire mission. The top bar starts on the left to just before they launch in Apollo 17, and it ends after they've been recovered by the USS Ticonderoga aircraft carrier on the right. And then the two different boxes below it are just zoomed in portions, two different levels of zoom, so that you can get down to hovering for every second of the mission. And you can kind of see here on the bottom one that you can make out what's going on. You can see that the United States flag had just been deployed and the first TV picture happened a few minutes before that, and they're about to deploy the cosmic ray experiment on the right. And this slides forward, this bottom thing slides as the thing plays. And as images appear, those are the little green ticks in the bottom uh, of that zoomed in rectangle. Um, as the images are taken, they appear when they were taken. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll time forward a little bit for you so you can hear how this all works together. Wait a minute. All right, I got you reaching for the flag. How's that? That's very good, Gene. Let me get it in stereo. Houston, uh, that's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. So if you continue playing this now, if you just let it play, it's going to play from this point for about another 10 days until they splash down and recovered by the USS Ticonderoga. So that it will actually just play back. And starting December, well, very late night, December 6th, uh, this will be in real time mode because it's, it's exactly 48 later, 48 years later. So you'll be able to use this website to check in for the 13 days of the mission. Um, from I think it's December 6th to, um, oh, I've got my days wrong now. Okay, you're, you're quizzing, I'm quizzing myself and I can't remember when they splash down. But if you, you can tune in and say, what were they doing? And it'll jump you in, what were they doing this second, exactly 48 years ago? And it allows you to, oh, oh, the crew's asleep. I guess I have to wait for them to wake up in, in a few hours. Or look, they're walking on the surface of the moon and you kind of pick up where they were, where they left off. So this is, this is how that idea of making the whole mission come back to life uh, that I mentioned before uh, works. And it's also, it's not just a kind of a cool thing to check out, which I hope everybody thinks it's cool, but it's also a tool. And this is how the tool aspect works. So this is kind of for scientific research. Here you type in one of those five digit sample numbers of the samples they collected on the surface. And you can pull up this panel that shows every picture that's been taken of this sample and it, with links straight to the Lunar Curation website of the department that I work in. And it has all this documentation and information about the lunar samples, and it contains every single photograph that's been taken of this sample since it was brought back, and has every academic paper that's ever been written that references this sample number, all in that panel, and it's all linked to the moment that Jack picked it up. So this is a new idea in how you can organize this kind of uh, broad scientific data uh, is by making it all indexed by when the reference uh, point occurred in the mission, you kind of once again are making everything about time. You're making everything about mission time. And you can see here how uh, this is one of the uh, animations in the, in the YouTube video because they're driving. 
And I'm going to play this little clip for you, and you can, I'll explain why in a second. Big uh, three uh, meter, three to four meter block out here all by itself on the light mantle. I got some pictures. It was at uh, 0885.6. Okay, copy that. And uh, it looked like a gray breccia. I'm not sure, though. It was just all I could see was the uh, surface texture, and it had the uh, nodular... Uh, or elongate nodular uh, texture that those wretches had up on the south of my seat. Okay, copy that, Jack. So here you can see uh, Jack Schmidt is being a very good field geologist and that he's describing what he's seeing as it's, as it's happening. And instead of writing in his field notebook, as like most notebook, as most geologists do, he got to uh, speak to Mission Control and have them write it down. You can see, and that was in the transcript. But here, the important thing is that image of the boulder he's describing in the photograph on the right suddenly now has new information added to it by Jack who's speaking. Normally that photograph and the transcript are not kept together and that caption of why Jack took that photograph and what he thought it was made of and it reminded him of something he saw on the other side of the valley the day before. This information is all starting to become contextually uh, helpful to each other. All the different media is working together to create something of new value. And uh, this is a, a picture that my friend Noah, who's standing at the front, sent me. Uh, this is a special day for me because that is my website up on the screen in Johnson Space Center. And this, the people in this class are astronaut candidates. This is the la latest class of people training to become the new generation of astronauts. And here they're uh, being taught using Apollo17.org the importance of uh, looking for the things that don't fit when you're performing field geology. And let, there's a rock over there that isn't like the rest. I'm gonna go over there and pick it up. And uh, in order to make that illustration, they actually showed the crew of Apollo 17 doing that work. And someone in this room is most likely to be the next person to walk on the moon. And uh, that's a pretty exciting thing. So I'm, I'm just going to keep motoring forward here a little bit uh, and explain that I now we're going to jump to Apollo 11. And I'm going to do this quite briefly. But I did Apollo 11, the same thing I, I just showed you for Apollo 17. I created a very similar experience for Apollo 11. It had all the photographs, has all the images, uh, has all the transcripts and all the, all the audio. But in addition to that, it has these 30 track audio tapes of mission control. Apollo 11 was a very dangerous mission in that a lot of things, first things happened. They had to land for the first time. They had to get out and walk on the surface for the first time. All the, and anything that's a, for the first time in engineering is a high risk thing. So this was really a, a mission that was about the crew surviving and not making mistakes and doing something very simple. They were only on the surface for two hours and 40 minutes. They were not on the surface for seven and a half hours a day for three days, like on Apollo 17. They just wanted to get onto the surface, collect some samples, explore a little bit, deploy some experiments, and get back off the surface to make sure nothing goes wrong. So really, it was Mission Control who were the heroes uh, of Apollo 11. And Mission Control, uh, all of their activity were recorded on these old tapes. And here's, some, here's a channel list of all the different positions. So basically every seat in mission control and some of the different communication lines were on these tapes. And uh, there was a huge effort to digitize these tapes. And here I had to get a selfie in front of the machine that can play the tapes back. There's only one machine that can play them back. And it's this one. And what this allowed us to do was take the silent film footage that was shot in mission control, because they had no microphones uh, when they filmed this footage in 1969. And we could use the audio that was recorded on that mission, yeah, sorry, onto those tapes uh, with that headset that you can see Dave Reed there has, he's talking into it and it's going onto the track for the flight dynamics officer. And because I had done a bunch of work to retime these tapes and to, and to work with them a bit, you could figure out, okay, that's, that's the flight dynamics officer. And it, this is just after launch. Let's go see if we can figure out and lip sync up this audio. And, you were, and we were able to re reanimate these, uh, these film uh, reels with audio for the first time in history. Select let me know when you have enough. Yeah, I 
Flight side, I'm careful. We finally got your radar data back. Looks good. Roger. Okay, all flight controllers, go no go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Flight Fido right on, real good. Roger. How's our margin looking, Bob? It looks okay with okay. about four and a half. Roger. Ecom, go. Roger surgeon. Copy. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. Roger, 1201 alarm. alarm. Same type, we're go, flight. Okay, we're go. We're go, same type, we're go. Flight fighter right on, real good. Roger. 2,000 feet, into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. So we, we did this for many, many, many different reels. Uh, and, and basically put them all in Apollo in real time. So this is a different website. Uh, it's a little bit more functional than the Apollo 17 one, which was my first try at it. Now this being my second try. Uh, and it includes 11,000 hours of mission control audio. And uh, so I've created kind of the deepest rabbit hole I could possibly fathom. And here's an example of it, what it looks like. And here's all the different tracks of audio from mission control. You can see a little mock-up there of Mission Control in the bottom right. You could sit in any, at any console and you can listen to the whole 240 hour long mission from that perspective. Um, and uh, I, don't, I haven't done that and I challenge anybody here to see if they can do that. Um, but it's, uh, it is truly a massive amount of research that can be done about exactly how Apollo 11 was uh, constructed and why it was a success. Oh, so I'm going to skip past place. And here's, here's the actual mission control room. And this is kind of a special thing that happened. These are the uh, retired flight controllers who were on shift uh, during the descent and landing of Apollo 11. And I helped to, to do the restoration of this mission control room to create those main display screens on the front. And uh, on the anniversary of descent and landing in July of Apollo 11, they all stood at their stations exactly 50 years later and listened to Apollo in real time, the website that I had created to commemorate the event to the second 50 years later. And if you can imagine what it must be like for these gentlemen to, to hear themselves and to, if they could have ever imagine that that would be happening. And I couldn't imagine that it would be happening either. It was really special for me. So, uh, that's the, those are the two Apollo missions that I've done. And I have a question here for you because we're going to now talk about some of NASA's future plans. Uh, what do you know about NASA's plans in going forward to the moon? So what are we doing next? All right, so we have answers coming in right away. Creek, Creek View High School says Artemis, as does Freedom Middle School. And any details you might know aside from a name would be good to sort of put in there. Now, Evansville Day School says going back to the moon and then on to Mars. Downs Elementary says return plan for 2024. Corpus Christi Catholic School says they're going to try to make a habitat. Uh, Aerospace Academy says return to the moon with the first woman and the next man to step foot on the moon. Central Heights says going basically to the moon, but then thinking about Mars. Northern Michigan University says to build a gateway to orbit the moon. We'll see if anything else comes in here. Downs Elementary says, again, that whole idea of going to the moon and then on to Mars. Um, and so it looks like we've got names of a mission, even things like uh, who might go. Now, who exactly, we don't know. Uh, so sounds like they have a little bit of idea yeah. about what we might be doing. I think they could present the next section. It sounds like everybody knows about the work that's being done, but I, maybe I'll talk a little bit about it anyway. But the, you guys are all right. The answer is Artemis. And the Artemis mission is, uh, is the new effort and Artemis was, in mythology, uh, Apollo's twin sister. And the reason Artemis is called Artemis is because Artemis will put the first woman on the moon and the next man and other people of different walks of life on the moon. And this time we're going back to try to learn how to stay and live on the moon. Um, 
And uh, that's a, this is a picture on the right of the Orion capsule. And the Orion capsule is sort of the new command module. And the Orion capsule seats four people instead of three. And uh, it's been in development for a long time and it has successfully flown in space. And it will fly atop a new rocket that's being built called the SLS, the Space Launch System. This rocket is kind of a generation uh, rocket after the shuttle. Uh, and in fact, it uses shuttle engines for the main engines in the bottom there uh, that you actually can't see in this image. And it has two boosters similar to the shuttle boosters on the left and right. But this rocket will be more powerful than the Saturn V. It will be the first rocket ever built that's more powerful than the Saturn V. The Saturn V had seven and a half million pounds of thrust and, this, and the Mark II uh, SLS rocket will have 11.7 million pounds of thrust. And I can't wait to be there in person to hear that. Uh, and it would be really something else to hear. When it discards all of its different stages and is in translunar injection mode, it will look something like this. This is a computer rendering. Um, and you can see the Orion module on the top and you can see the propulsion system behind it and the European servers module just underneath it. There. And the first uh, people to return to the moon will be on a mission called Artemis II. And it will be similar to the Apollo 8 mission. It'll do an orbit around the moon and it will come back again um, and it won't land. It will be just testing everything out, all the things that we need to do, making sure everything works. And then it will be Artemis 3 uh, when we land. But it is not the same configuration as Apollo. It's, it is lunar orbit rendezvous, but it's a very strange lunar orbit because we're going to a place that I saw one of the answers that we're building the Lunar Gateway. So here's a, another artist's rendering of what the gateway might look like with the Orion uh, module coming to dock with it. So essentially what happens is the crews come to gateway and then it's basically like a space station around the moon and they can live there and do science and do work and they don't have to go down to the surface. And then when they do decide to go down to the surface or the mission calls for them to do that, they will be a human landing system, an HLS, so it will go from Gateway and land on the surface of the moon. Here's another picture of, of Orion and Gateway. And uh, this, this is a very long orbit. This, the Gateway will have about a one week period of its orbit, a very elliptical orbit around the moon. So when you land on the surface with, and you have to rendezvous with something that's in such an elliptical orbit, you can stay on the surface for either a very short period of time, a matter of hours, uh, like four hours. And by the, if you stay longer than four hours, then the gateway will be too far away to rendezvous with and you have to wait a week. So there's two options. We can either stay on the surface for a couple of hours or we can stay on the surface for a week or more. Um, but there's nothing in between. So the, all the planning that's happening right now is to try to, is to plan for, uh, to stay there for a week and to design all the human landing systems. These spacecraft have not been built yet so that when we land on the moon, um, we'll be able to live there for a week. So the phase one of the Artemis mission, which will contain one, two, and three, uh, is kind of depicted here. And you can see that it will, it will mean that by Artemis three, there'll be a crewed mission to gateway and to the lunar surface. And the goal for that is 2024. But this time we're also not going, like you saw in that very first slide I showed you of all the different Apollo landing sites, we're not going to an equatorial position we're going to the South Pole. And we're going to the South Pole of the moon for a very specific reason. And you can see here as this animation from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data, that there are areas on the surface of the moon that are always in shadow. They never get sunlight. No matter how the moon rotates, it's always going to be shadow inside those craters. And if you actually play those shadows over time, you can create an image like this. And the dark regions show that there's never sun in these dark regions. So we're gonna land on one of the not dark regions and then explore into the, uh, into the darker regions. And the reason for that is that we have discovered uh, evidence of water being inside these dark regions. This is a unbelievably exciting discovery because we didn't think there was any water left on the moon. If water evaporates and goes away, it's something that geologists call volatile and a volatile will go away over time. But here in, uh, in these permanently shadowed areas, 
they actually impacted the upper stage of the rocket that brought the lunar reconnaissance orbiter to the moon into one of these permanently shadowed areas just to see what would it would spray up and they looked at that spray that came out of the crater when the impact occurred with the LRO's instrumentation and they found hydrosol which is evidence of, of ice water and they think it's about four percent ice they're not four percent water based on the evidence of what came up really they only have that one data point and at this point it's still a guess and we need to go there like we did on apollo and figure out if we were right about our ideas so this is we're going to go there and if we can find uh water and we can learn how to process that water then we'll be able to live on the moon and use that as resources that are on the moon to live with because with water you can make oxygen and you can make hydrogen which is fuel so you can essentially make energy and you can also make stuff to breathe with and you can also make water to drink and this would be a key ingredient to learning to live permanently on the moon and here's a here's another animation of what it might look like when when a uh, that's a, a made-up human landing system in the background there uh, that's not the real thing but uh, with some instrumentation and learning to live in those uh, on the south pole near the sources of water and that's the end of my presentation uh, and I'd like to thank everybody for listening, and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time, but I'll let Paige lead that. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Ben. And I want the students and the educators out there to realize, you know, we saw comments of these great images, these great videos, but Ben took it upon himself to integrate all of it so that people could experience Apollo 17 and Apollo 11 in real time. And I mean, it is absolutely fascinating. And for, for all of you out there, if you want to spend some time over your holiday break, uh, I'll make sure the teachers have these websites as well to really re-experience Apollo as it happened. Um, it's, it's, pretty amazing not only to think about these apollo missions but the work that ben has put into this um, to integrate it all so people could from multiple generations relive and be inspired by apollo so thank you ben for Thanks sharing your expertise and what you have done and i know there are some questions that have come in and we'll take our first six minutes or so to start questions and then we'll continue on if you have time after the top of the hour. Fantastic. I definitely have time and I'd be happy to answer questions. I did see some questions uh, scrolling by in the chat window, but I didn't have a chance to stop my presentation to answer them and I'd be happy. Yeah, to and sometimes if you had a question in the chat window, by all means, put it into the Q&A because it's so easy to lose track of them. And I know one of the questions that came in was, um, was about how many hours did it take you to do Apollo 17 or Apollo in real time? How, how wow. much time did that take you? That's classified information because I hate to think about how long it took. Uh, Apollo 17 took me six years and it was on evenings and weekends while I had a different job. Um, and I did it just because it was something uh, fun to work on and, and I just loved uh, access to this material and I could ride along with the crew and try to recreate these missions and learn about them in, in really great detail. So it sounds like a horrible long job, but really it was just for fun. Um, and I'm just happy that something um, so accessible like Apollo17.org, it can, could have been put out there at the end of that effort so that other people can follow along and have that same experience I did, but it won't take them six years. Apollo in real time took me two years. Uh, it's a shorter mission, there was less material, um, and I knew what I was doing uh, by the time I was doing it because I had already done 17. When I, you have to realize I didn't really know what I was making the whole time when I was working on 17, and it took a lot of experimentation to get things right. Um, and now I'm working on Apollo 13 in real time, uh, and I don't know how many people have seen the Apollo 13 film, but that's the mission where an explosion happened on board. Uh, and it, the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of 13 will be in April. And, uh, and I want a real time experience so that people can hear the people in Mission Control working overtime to save the crew's lives. And it was really a heroic effort. And the tapes that I'm putting online for 13 have never been heard 
in 50 years. Uh, I had to get them from the National Archives and um, I'm just in the process of, of having them digitized at Johnson Space Center now. Uh, and I'll do the same process that I invented for Apollo in real time and I'll put 13 online and that will take about eight months. So you can see that I'm going from six years to two years to eight months. Um, I think some of the other missions might take longer than that. Um, eight, uh, it's, it is actually way faster to do 13 because they didn't land on the surface. Um, but that's, this is the kind of time frames that we're talking about. So he is literally, and you said you did this over six years for um, Apollo 17 on your own time and nights and weekends. Did I uh, hear that right. correctly? <laughs> yes. And then uh, NASA took an interest in the work I had done and offered me a job. It was kind of the short version of that. So I'm excited to now get to work on the return to the moon. I mean, what an, what an amazing result of something I just did as a passion project on the side. So that's amazing. Again, for, for you students uh, out there, you know, this was work that, did, that Ben did because he was passionate about it and did it on nights and weekends. Nobody told him what to do. Nobody told him how to do it. He didn't even know how to do it. He figured it out. That's problem solving at its best and, and really. Um, oh, that's for, like, like, it's Lego, right? It's really all it was. I was essentially playing Lego, grown up version. Uh, and just seeing how I could piece this stuff together and if I could make something. And you know, being a software developer, I don't know how many of uh, the students listening have a background or have tried coding, but that's essentially what it is. You're just, you can peck your way through it. And I wasn't, you know, I'm, I did go to university for computer science, but I didn't know how to do any 3D graphics rendering and I had to teach myself Cinema 4D to do that. And you, you can Google your way through these problems and that doesn't mean anything bad about you. It means you're gonna get a result in the end. And that's essentially what I did here. The, the program that I wrote that is the Apollo 17 website was my first JavaScript application I'd ever written. That's not a language that I have much experience in. And, uh, and just went for it. And if you know that it's possible, you can spend the time and just get it done. That's terrific and a great message. Now, you might have just mentioned this briefly, but Meadow Creek, one of our uh, groups from um, Bedford, Texas, they wanted to know what software program did you use to make your simulations of the lunar rover going across the surface, as well as the integration of these tapes and videos and all of that? Sure. Um, the, the tapes and videos was all uh, custom software that I wrote in a language called Python. Uh, that processed all the tapes and took all the tape, the time drift out of them because these are all real to real analog tapes with a huge amount of drift. And I came up with an algorithm that could uh, snap them to mission time and then that, that's what allows them to all be online and Apollo in real time. And for the 3D rendering, uh, I don't even remember how I picked it, but I did it all in a piece of software called Cinema 4D. And Cinema 4D is, a, is commercial software that's used for making, you know, you know graphics for television commercials and um, some special effects for films and things like that. And it's really fun to work with. So making those uh, lunar rover things was super exciting and fun. And again, being a hobby, I could stop anytime it got too, too overwhelming or if I got too frustrated on a problem I couldn't solve, um, I could take a break and then come back to it maybe a few days later and oh, is that problem I was trying to solve again? And then next thing you know, you're working on it. Um, so, you know, it, and, and actually when you learn things like that, you're only learning them for the period that you're using them. I'm not a Cinema 4D expert now. In fact, it's been a couple of years since I did these renderings. If I opened the software now, I'd probably have to start again. But that's okay, because I managed to get the outcome that I wanted, which was these renderings. And I got to have fun doing it. It's funny, it's like if you don't use it, you lose it, but then you yeah. can get back. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Now, we are at the top of the hour, and so being respectful of um, our groups on the line, if they have to depart, we totally understand, but I want to take a moment to thank all the groups that have joined us today from all across the United States. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. We will be archiving this. I will send out links when I do have them, and I'll also make sure to include these links to Ben's uh, websites. I also want to take a moment to especially thank Ben for those of you that might have to depart because Ben, we so appreciate not only you sharing what you've done with us today during our webinar, but for putting together things that, 
you know, perhaps the students of our future might consider, you know, uh, some type of career doing this for Artemis. You never know, uh, or whatever it is their passion may be. So Ben, thank you for uh, your time and for sharing this and for being willing to stay on the line for a few extra minutes with us. My pleasure, thanks again. All right, so for those that can stay on the line, let me look at what additional questions we have. Now, I, I see a couple that came in from Murfreesboro Middle School, and they're in Illinois, and they had a um, two sort of questions. One is real quick. One was, in some of the videos that you were showing of the mission control and areas, um, were there astronauts uh, in those videos as well in, uh, that you showed? Yes. Uh, the people that spoke speak to the crew, so let me see if I can go back to some of those videos. Like this guy. Let's see if I can pause. Roger, 12. So there's three astronauts in this, in this frame. Um, on the left is <coughs> Charlie Duke. Charlie Duke was on Apollo 16, but here we are, in a, he's the Capcom on Apollo 11. And the rule is the capsule communicator, the person that speaks to the crew, is another astronaut. And the reason for this is so that uh, any translation or stress that's happening on the ground of different people that need things, it goes through somebody who's going to put it in terms and in a priority list that is from one astronaut to another. So the crew doesn't have to deal with 10 different voices all telling them to do different things. They get to hear from the Capcom. So here we have Charlie Duke on the left, Jim Lovell, he was commander on Apollo 13, and Fred Hayes on, on his left, who is, was lunar module pilot on Apollo 13. And 13 is the one I just mentioned that had an explosion on board. So they didn't get a chance to land on the moon, and, they, and that hadn't happened yet in this film footage. Uh, but he, they all made it home safely, and, and Jim Lovell is, and Fred Hayes are both still alive today. And so is Charlie Duke. That's absolutely terrific. And what a great observation from Murfreesboro Middle School to even uh, uh, notice that. Uh, so, so that's great. Um, let me actually jump to Creekview High School, because they had a couple of questions as well. And we might come back to Murfreesboro's other question. Um, Creekville High School, one of their quick questions was, um, where were the SLS launch from? Will that be from Cape Canaveral? Yes, it will. Uh, that is going to be, uh, that's where everything is launched is, well, actually that's not true. Oh, that's where all the big things are launched. And the reason is, is Florida, that tip of Florida is very close to the equator. It's the closest part of the United States that's uh, to the equator. And the closer you are to the equator when you launch, the more of the momentum of Earth's rotation you can take advantage of when you're going into orbit. And that just means that you need less fuel. So uh, th there are other places where launches occur, and especially when you're going into an orbit that isn't uh, equatorial, uh, and you know Vandenberg Air Force Base and places like that. Um, but really, Cape Canaveral is the place where all the big hardware is launched, and that's the plan for Artemis. Excellent. Now, you also mentioned, and this is related to Creekville High School's question here, um, something about uh, Gateway. And they are asking if the Lunar Space Station, which perhaps is a synonym for Gateway, will that be solar powered? Yes, it will. Here's a picture of it. You can see the solar panels on it. Um, it will be solar powered. And it's kind of really just a staging spot. Like it's kind of a, it, it's very little compared to the International Space Station, which is humongous. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really just more like a permanent uh, campsite. <laughs> for lack of a better term, where uh, the crew, crews can prepare uh, to go to the surface and they can analyze samples that are brought back up from the surface and then send some of those samples back home. So you can picture it as like this little tiny uh, laboratory that, that might be, you know, I don't know, the size of a bus inside or something like that, not very big. Uh, but it's referred to as the gateway, but it is a space station. Excellent. And, and these are really exciting times, you know, to think about Apollo and like Ben was saying, in a couple of days, 48 years ago, Apollo was, Apollo 17 was happening. I mean, those, you folks out there on the line right now, I mean, this is the next generation of 
of, of exploration that you're going to experience and see happen right before your eyes. And with the type of technology we have these days and being able to see things um, as they're happening, uh, you know, it's really exciting to think about, as well as exciting to think about your future roles in this. You know, Ben's talking about work that's been done and work he's doing now, but um, there, there's a future that when we need folks like yeah. you. Yeah, apologies. I meant to, to bring that up as I was describing this is that the reason I was talking about how many different people worked on Apollo and, and all their different jobs and the point that I didn't make to everybody was that the, the kids that I'm talking to today are at the right age to become uh, participants in the space program when they're uh, graduated from university. Because this is really the beginning of, of a renaissance that's happening for space exploration. And uh, it won't be me doing it. It won't be the people that are around today doing it. It'll be you guys doing it. And if you, all you need to do is take an interest in it and decide that you want that to be something that you're working on. And, you know, I see a picture like this and, you know, whether you like science, engineering, computer programming, whether you're an artist, a videographer, uh, an educator, a newspaper reporter, there's, like Ben said, an opportunity and, and, and it's, it's for the taking for all of you out there. Um, uh, there's lots of possibilities. So thank you, Ben, for making that point right now and reinforcing it. Absolutely. So um, sort of related to um, this whole idea with the uh, gateway, Creekview High School is also wondering if, if you know about any discussion about building a space station on either the Lagrange points like L4 or L5. Do you know anything about that? No, I haven't heard any, any plans for that. Um, I would, I would but that, just, that doesn't mean they don't exist. That just means I haven't heard of them. Um, that would be very difficult. Those Lagrange points are very far away. Um, and th there wouldn't really be much of an advantage of being there. There's not a lot of, not a lot of exploration for people to do in those positions. But that is, for example, where we're putting the James Webb telescope. We're putting it at a Lagrange point. that puts it so many thousands of miles away from both the moon and Earth that it would be extremely difficult to get to to service that telescope so that we have to make sure it's going to work. Uh, before we launch it. Um, and I find that really exciting. They, they basically put it at a Lagrange point that allows it to uh, use the shadows of, of the Earth and the Moon in an advantageous way, along with huge amounts of thermal protection to keep the telescope super cold. And, by, and it's an infrared telescope, so by keeping it super cold, it allows the instrument to be even more sensitive. And it's going to be able to possibly actually see some of the planets around other stars with the amount of uh, resolution that it has uh, rather than just indirect evidence of those planets. And that's going to be an exciting time for deep space exploration and that's for sure. Yes, very, very exciting times. Whether you're, you know, for human exploration, the moon and Mars, as well as things like uh, the James Webb telescope. So great question, great answer. So I'm going to go back to Murfreesboro Middle School. They had 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 a question early on that one of their students was wondering about. And um, can you talk a little bit about volcanoes on the moon? I mean, did any of these missions land near volcanoes? Are there volcanoes on the moon? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, uh, I can talk a little bit about it. The I'm not an expert. I am not a uh, <laughs> just my my. Um, my excuse is that I have, you know, I, I am not a geologist myself, but back to this animation of the surface, you can see that this plane that, I, that it's rotating in to see, this flat area that has craters in it, it's kind of a darker color. This is actually melted uh, lava. Uh, and then these hills are different. These hills are of, from a different origin. And the melted basalt on the surface, it's also covered in, uh, very fine dust from meteor impacts for billions of years. So it basically has, you know, a, a, a kind of covering, a powder covering of debris from meteor impacts. Um, this is a lava flow. And on the right there, that white part uh, that just went out of frame, 
is a landslide that came down from the South Massif mountain that you can see in the, in the top of the video there. And, uh, and that, this is why they went to the Taurus Litro Valley. It kind of has everything. It has the basalt lava plain that melted about three, three billion years ago. It has lots of different uh, material that's been kicked up by these impacts. So there's bedrock lying on the surface like that boulder that we saw Jack drive by. Uh, and it has the moon kind of shrunk and caused wrinkles that, that are called scarps. And there's actually one in the distance that you can barely make out in the animation right there called the Lee Lincoln scarp. So they wanted to go explore the scarps and see what that was all about. It's kind of a, a type of fault. Uh, and the, it was just a huge geological exploration. Um, but the history of volcanism on the moon is that it, it all, the moon was a molten body, kind of like the early earth. And that was about uh, three and a half billion years ago. And it melted uh, and solidified, sorry, it solidified and the core was still molten like the earth. Uh, but now we've discovered after the Apollo missions that the core of the moon is no longer liquid. It is cooled as well, and the moon is not ge geologically active anymore. So there is no recent volcanoes on the mountain, uh, <laughs> on the moon. There are no recent volcanoes on the moon. And, uh, and there's, uh, but they still, everything being kind of locked in time, you can go back and explore essentially three billion years of history really easily because there's no, um, there's no uh, weather or anything like that that's changing the surface. So it was, it's really an important place for us to go explore scientifically. I hope that and answers that, a little bit of the question. Yeah, no, I think that, uh, that, that was great. And what's interesting too is, as Ben mentioned, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has been orbiting and continues to orbit and gives us great views of the surface of the moon. But that in addition to the lunar samples that Ben referred to earlier, those lunar rocks, actual samples picked up from the moon have been so important in helping scientists piece together the story of the moon, its history and evolution over time. And so, every little piece of data that scientists get, it's interesting because it helps them perhaps answer some questions, but always sparks additional questions that they want to further investigate. So, um, you know, science is one of those things where the more you ask and the more you find out, the more you realize you want to know some additional things. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why it's so important for us to go back to the moon and get more samples. At, at other places, like I mentioned, looking for volatiles like water on the South Pole and to go confirm those theories one way or another. Excellent. Well, I'm going to see if there are any additional questions that might have come in. And if anyone out there still has any questions, we'll give you a moment or so to think about that. Um, but in the meantime, we are about 15 minutes past the top of the hour. And for those of you that are still on the line, we appreciate you sticking around with us. We appreciate you learning more from the things that we have hopefully shared today. And perhaps we've sparked some additional questions in your minds that you might want to further investigate. But with that, I also want to give Ben, do you have any sort of closing remarks or any other things that you'd like to sort of say to these groups before we officially bring this to a close? Uh, well, I think that the most important thing I've already mentioned, and that is that uh, I don't want any of the people listening today to think that all the cool things are already happening and they're too young to, to participate, because even cooler than what's happening now is what's going to be happening when they're old enough to participate. So I hope they take an interest in it and, uh, and continue their studies and work within the space program when they're old enough to help out. Absolutely, and whether you start as an intern or start you know, uh, deciding on what you wanna pursue in your future careers, uh, the door's open. NASA really does need you, and I, I definitely think that these folks out there with the answers they've given, I love the scratch and sniff answer. I mean, I'm the, you know, the different answers that came in about being able to capture things and, uh, you know, experiences about all those five senses. So, you know, with creativity and with passion, 
uh, that can take you a long, long way with what you might want to do in your future. So if you're passionate about it, pursue it. Well, with that, I don't see any additional questions that have come in. So uh, with that, we'll bring this to an official close. Again, Ben, thank you so much for sharing all that you've shared with us today. For the students that are on the line or who might be listening to the archive, thank you so much for taking an interest in learning about Apollo in real time and how you might think to get involved in the future. Thanks, everyone. It was a real pleasure to present to you.